Um, hi, welcome back to my channel. Uh, well, welcome, welcome me back to my own channel. Yeah, it's been, I just looked it up, it's been two years since I posted a video. A lot has changed in two years. I've had my baby, I'm married, um, but one of the biggest things that have changed is I actually regave my life to Christ. One of the things that I was really praying for and that I've always heard people say, but I've never like understood what it was like, was when people say, God told me to do this. He spoke to me. And I'm not gonna lie, in my head, every time I'd hear that, I was thinking, okay, Lion King, here is grown up Simba. Here's Mufasa talking to him from the sky. Simba. That's what I imagined. Anytime I read the Bible, that's what I always imagined too. Because people were like, the Lord came to me. This is what the sovereign Lord says. And I'm like, okay, Simba. <laughs> but it'd be like, Moses, or you know what I'm saying? I've been praying, trying to really delve in and understand that. I've been reaching out to some of the leaders at church, really trying to delve in and understand that also. The way it was described to me is it's kind of like, obviously he can do whatever he wants to. It's a reoccurring thought, feeling that lines up with God's word. Who we know him to be through scripture. So one of the things that I've been feeling this pull to do is share my testimony. I did not know what in the world testimony was. I grew up in church off and on, but honestly, there was just all these words that were just thrown around and I'm like, yeah. Don't know what that means, but I've heard that one a thousand times, that word's important. I mean, you try to put some context clues together, but sometimes living in the South, it's a little bit hard to do that because we make up our own language half the time. So before I get started, I just want to open up a prayer because it feels weird if I don't. I feel very awkward. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to sit down. Thank you for the pull to sit down and finally film this video that I have had planned since uh, the middle of June. I just ask that you will give me the words to articulate the message that you have given. And I pray that my awkwardness, pray that you shine through that and that Maybe somebody can relate to this testimony and either come closer to you, begin to seek you more, or if there's anybody on the other side watching this video who does not save, does not know you, and really wants to get to know you, Lord, I pray that you knock on their hearts and you tell them that today is the day and that you have already done it all. Salvation is theirs. All they have to do is reach out and take it. Anxiety, be gone in the name of Jesus. Fear, be gone in the name of Jesus awkwardness be gone in the name of Jesus. We love you and we thank you for all that you do. But if you never did anything for us again, we would still love you because you are awesome. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so testimony. Whenever I was beginning to write down my testimony, I have it literally in pages on a journal. I just wanted to do a basic search on the word because you always hear about testimonies and stuff when it comes to court. Um, so in a court of law, what is testimony? Well, according to Google, it is the public declaration of truth or facts by witness under oath. So the public declaration, that means there are people and you are speaking these things and you are speaking truth or facts based on your eyewitness account of something. But you're not just speaking it, you're speaking it under Oath. So whenever I got back into church, um, one of the first sermons that I heard, um, the pastor was talking um, and he wanted to plan a testimony service and he started talking about, he is very, from what I've noticed, he likes taking words and like separating out syllables, but the way he does it, it makes sense for the definition of the word. So for testimony, he broke it off as test, I'm on, why? Why am I on this test? It could be because someone could relate to your story. God could use you as a vessel to win souls for heaven. I've been on a lot of tests in my 20, almost 27 years. I can thankfully say that I've seen the other side of this and there's no other way to explain it. Okay. So it's kind of a long one. Um, I keep looking down. 
my notes are under the desk right here on the floor. So I grew up seeing some things that no child should ever see and experiencing things that no child should ever experience. We were in and out of church based on honestly what felt like depending on how bad things were at home. So alcoholism was raging. We were in church and you'd find us there crying at the altar with mama. Otherwise, if things were chill, we weren't there. So I grew up seeing church and God as an option. This is in no way trying to bash anybody. It's taken a lot for me to get to that point. And um, honestly, it took God. Um, but I'm not trying to bash anybody or try to point out other people's wrongs. I am just, this was the test. And it's gonna to lead to my why. So I have them listed in bullet points in my notes of the test that I was on. A couple of the things that hallmarked my 27-ish years was childhood trauma. And I say it that way with because that is the exact quotation that therapists and psychiatrists and honestly the world at this point, that is what they would term it as. And for a long time, yeah, I termed it as that and I identified with that. I was also in and out of church, so I knew that there was an existence of God. Sometimes I would go back and forth questioning because at the time I was like, how could God let us go through this situation, the childhood trauma? So in turn, it ended up leading me down a road of trying to solve my own problems caused by alcohol with alcohol also led me down a road of suicide well suicidal attempts i'm still here um i now i finally understand why i thank jesus but suicide attempts multiple 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 like literally every single night suicide attempts self-harm overdose sorry mom premarital sex and overall just feeling like i had no worth no purpose i'm a failure i'm a disgrace in those terms, those feelings of being a failure, a disgrace, not worth it, no purpose, why am I here? It really intensified after um, I graduated respiratory school in 2020. So I graduated respiratory school. I went and I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a respiratory therapist at a level one trauma center. Who would have thought I'd be able to do it? And it wasn't for me. And I struggled with, again, self-harm, led to an eating disorder, listing out all of those things. I looked at it and I was like, wow, that's pretty not cool. Um, but there was a verse that I felt tapping me on the shoulder and it was Romans 828 and we know that in all things god works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose which is where the story starts to turn um like i said at the end of 2020 i was dealing with the all the failure you suck what's your purpose you have no life you've thrown away two years of your life you're not you're going to be behind all your classmates and i was dealing with all the words from people coming at me just being like what are you doing you're not doing the right thing but yeah i quit the hospital i went running back with my tail between my legs to my previous job at daycare i would gotten married in october 2020 and then in november 2020 I was at my grandma's funeral. I guess I should go get aspen's ball. Okay, my daughter's up, having a dress. She threw up this whole thing if you hear her. But I'll never forget in November of 2020, just whenever my grandma passed away. And she had her funeral. I'll never forget. Girl, what church of God? The pastor was talking and he said, you know, I think one of the biggest things we can do for Linda's legacy is to know that her death brought people closer to God. I'm just sitting there, minding my own, literally sweating like 
I've always heard the term sweating like a sinner in church. I don't understand why you'd be sweating like a sinner in church because a sinner is, a church is supposed to be a hospital for sinners, not a trophy case for the saved, but I digress. I'm sitting there, I'm dripping sweat. I feel like my lungs are compressing in on me. I feel like I'm gonna vomit. I think I'm gonna faint and I'm just like it's okay whatever I guess I'm I got pregnant on my honeymoon I don't know the crazy part is is the pastor he zeroed in on me and he says you'll know if God's talking to you because you feel like you're you're sweating you feel like you're gonna vomit like your lungs are going to implode and he's literally describing these things staring at me and then he says Jesus is calling Jesus is knocking answer the door answer the call so i did um i did not get out of the pew because a anxiety was taking over my life at that point but yeah i just sat in my seat but i answered the call and i regave my heart to jesus i tried out a church with my sister april and i went several times i felt good about it for a little bit and then it kind of it kind of hit and i was like Something, something don't feel right. I describe it as a Joel osteen -y kind of church where it was like very positive, very encouraging, very uplifting, which sounds great until you realize he is telling people what they want to hear. It was like they were afraid to offend, lose numbers. People just have an itching and they want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear what God said. God's already said it. And it's not up to us to pick and choose the parts that we like from it. Like, literally, it's all here. Yeah, back to my story. Um, I went to church with my parents for a little bit. And then I gave up. And I said, you know what? I'm fine. I don't need church. I believe I'm good. I don't, I don't need this. Not long after I said those words, I'd say maybe a couple months, I found out I was pregnant. But not only did I find out I was pregnant, I found out that I was pregnant and that there were major complications. So I was already considered high risk because I'm overweight. At the high risk doctor, when they did their weekly ultrasounds to like check and make sure everything was okay, they were noticing her feet were deformed, her ankles and like her ankles curved and her feet were like this. Her bowel was dilated. It wasn't confirmed, but she was, um, had a high percent chance of having cystic fibrosis, which if you don't know, the quick for rundown of cystic fibrosis is, um, it's a respiratory condition predominantly. Um, it, depending on the variant, it can also affect the GI system. Um, which hers happens to, but with CF, it's like the lungs, they have just an overproduction of this thick, sticky mucus. And because this mucus is so sticky, it's like any germs, any pollutants, anything can get in and stick. And because the mucus is so thick and so sticky, it's hard to clear it. And because of that, and the inability to clear their lungs effectively, like you and I can, the things just kind of sit and it grows and it can harbor infections. And the goal of the treatment of CF is just try to prolong the health of the lungs and reduce as much scarring as possible so that they can live a longer, healthier life. That's the scientific carnal view of it. She was gonna be born with all these complications and I was like, oh crap. So like how I was raised, because things were bad, I looked to God and I started going to church and I was like, oh, what in the world? I was praying. I had, I was on prayer list. I had people praying for the baby. She was born at 39 weeks. I was induced. She had an emergency surgery day four of her life. She was in NICU. She was taken away to NICU pretty much right after she was born. And it was a planned thing. So I really didn't get to see her or even meet her really until a day or two after she was born. Um, day four, I got a phone call saying that they were taking her in for emergency surgery because the bile was so dilated it looked like her intestine was actually going to explode. They did surgery. She was a Nikki for a month and a half because she would not eat. 
Um, and they didn't want to send her home without her being able to eat. They ended up surgically placing a feeding tube in her belly. And then it was confirmed that she does have cystic fibrosis. All of that while being postpartum. And if you've ever had a child, postpartum is rough. You're adjusting to all these new parts of motherhood. Like the functionality of your body. Your hormones, they are going crazy. The postpartum depression, anxiety, rage, all the things are real. I am trying to go through all that. I'm stressed because I can't, like my body's just not producing breast milk. I can't give my child breast milk, which is one thing that all these doctors were saying, that's gonna be the best thing for her, especially with her condition and she needs that. And I'm like, <laughs> It's just not, it's not working. I, 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 can't, I can't get nothing to come out. But yeah, you can imagine how low I got. I very quickly went into a state of panic and I started to keep Aspen sheltered from the world. I wouldn't take her anywhere unless she was going to feeding therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, the gastroenterologist, the pulmonologist, the pediatrician. I, mean, I feel like I'm missing some. The orthopedic, the prosthetic people, the hospital, the emergency room, whatever. Anytime there was a family function or I was gonna hang out with family, I interrogated them. Is anyone sick? Does anyone have a sniffle? because well, I was told any sniffle, any slight cough, anything this child gets, they're thrown on her own antibiotics immediately. You, if the antibiotics don't take, then you get thrown into the hospital for two weeks, put on IV antibiotics. So I was living in a state of fear and I went and took her to church. I, nothing. I was living in a state of fear. Fast forward now to 2023. I am a weary, I'm exhausted. Stay-at-home mom. Stay-at-home medical mom who's barely staying afloat. I am not showering. <laughs> and granted, she's almost two. Not showering. Not taking care of myself. Obviously, I let my weight go. I, I lost sight of everything. I went through therapy and be through better help. After like therapist hopping for a little bit, trying to find one that I really connected with, I found my current therapist. She moves to a clinic that does teletherapy. I'm like, cool, insurance will cover it. So I go over there and start seeing her there. So with this clinic, and since insurance was gonna be helping pay, she had to do a quote unquote formal assessment. There's this whole thing talking about my past and things that I'm like wanting to work on, some goals that I have. One of the sections of the assessment was about spirituality, faith and if I practice any religion. I didn't know how to answer that. I literally just sat there for a second and I'm like, I grew up a Christian but I feel like I've just poked so many holes in it. I just don't believe anymore. That answer, it gave me chills and I was just like, holy crap, how did I get here? <laughs> this is, this is, how, how did this happen? And then her response was, yeah, I think that's how a lot of the people of your generation and these upcoming generations see it. And I'm just like, something, something's not right here. I got to, I, I got to fix it. I felt insanely, insanely convicted. Um, literally the words I was about to say is I felt heavenly convicted, which honestly, that's exactly what it was. After the therapy session had ended, I began on a insane church hunt. And whatever I say insane, I mean, it's gonna sound creepy how I found the church I attend now. So my cousins have a singing group and they go around to all these different churches, you know, and they sing, minister, the whole thing. And I'm like, they grew up going to Norwood Church of God. That was their childhood, Norwood Church of God, the very place where I felt the panic, the anxiety, all of that stuff set in that led me back to Christ at my grandma's funeral. So like the creep I am, I went to one of their Facebooks and I started searching <laughs> through their likes and I started finding churches and I'd click on them and I would look 
and I, if they had like a live sermon or whatever, I'd listen to it. Like if I couldn't feel the spirit watching through the screen, I clicked off and I started searching for another one. So I went through several and then there was one with a purple logo that caught my eye. And it was a purple crown and it was beautiful. And it was the purple crown surrounded by white. Oh, it was beautiful. And I clicked on it and they had sermons. So of course I clicked and I watched. And immediately, I kid you not, I was watching and I was like, okay, this is kind of similar to the church I was attending before, but just the worship part. Because it was like a huge congregational, there was people up on stage and they weren't doing like traditional hymns like I was always used to. But I liked that. And the music, it wasn't this oh uplifting wonderful stuff to uplift us carnally, but it was uplifting the Lord. It was praising the Lord. It was worship music. And I loved it and i also love that it had like a different flair i keep trying so hard not to be offensive whenever i'm saying these things but honestly i think that's the problem with the world is people are so afraid to be offended to get offended that they don't want to say the truth i don't know how churches got this way today but there is a huge separation okay you got the separate denominations which okay cool whatever but you also have separation of races because how many times will you be riding up and down the road and you'll see you have one church over here is predominantly white people. You have a church over here. It is predominantly black people. Over here, predominantly Mexican, so on, so forth. What I liked about this church is it combined all the elements of all of it together. But also something that really kind of stuck out to me was the pastor and how he was preaching and how he was teaching and how he was breaking everything down so beautifully. I also love that he's not afraid to tell the nitty gritties of it all. He's not afraid to step on toes because honestly, we need our toes stepped on. We've been pacified for too long and that's why the world is going to hell on a hand basket with a pretty bow on it. We need to stop being afraid to offend people. We need to stop being afraid to step on toes for the oh my gosh i'm going to lose my numbers i'm going to lose likes i'm going to lose followers i'm going to lose subscribers lose them you are planting a seed the lord is going to know that you tried begged and you begged and you begged and you told them the nitty-gritty you told them the gospel you told them how it's going to be you told them what they needed to hear but whether they want to harden their hearts or whether they want to open their hearts and accept it that is on them i found the sermon and then it took me over to spotify and it was like a podcast with all of the sermons up to date on there. And I was like, amazing. And then on Spotify, I found the app for the church. And I was like, awesome. So I went, I downloaded the app just to kind of check it out, see what it was about. And I found a women's Bible study. And I was like, awesome. I want to do this. And it was even better because it met via Zoom. And I was like, Perfect. You know, me living in fear of my child being around germs and she has to come with me. So through these messages, these sermons, the Bible studies, all of that, I repented to God for backsliding. And I also asked him to fuel my hunger for him and just keep me wanting more. And let me tell you, he did. I have never felt so like just on fire and wanting to like if you would have told me like a couple years ago that I would be sitting here on camera openly speaking about these things and even having these conversations with my family like I wouldn't believe you if you would have told me that I would want to go to Bible college and take Bible courses and I would actually be paying to take Bible courses so that I could really just learn just more about the history and the and the context and just everything about how the Bible was written and interpreted the way that it was intended to be interpreted. I would think you were crazy. Flash forward to May of 2023. I felt an urge to attend an in-house service because up until this point I was watching just the live streams. Um, again, living in fear, trying to protect my child. I kept ignoring that call though because of aspens, cystic fibrosis, the crowds, germs, ETCs. I log on to Bible study one Friday morning and it's just me 
Pastor Emily, Pastor Nikki. But they urged me to come to an in-house service. And I told them, you know, it's like almost an hour drive for me. I don't really know. I had been praying and Googling how to hear God's voice, as I mentioned in the beginning. And one of the ways I read about was God using people to tell you the things that you've been thinking about over and over and over again. This was God. This was God saying, come to an in-house service. And I was like, okay, yep. I'm going to go the following Sunday. And the next couple of days, I started listening to, you know, the podcast and all that. And message. <laughs> I kid you not, the very first one I listened to after this moment, the message was, it don't matter how far out you are, you come to God's house. It doesn't matter how far up the street it is, you need to come to God's house. So that Sunday, I went. And I slipped into the back and I loved it. And I was so happy because I was like, I have finally found a spirit-filled church and I felt great about attending. And I felt great about bringing my child and any future children. And I felt great about bringing my husband. And it was like finally my relationship with God was so much stronger than it's been ever in my 27-ish years. I've been learning all about like trying to find callings and purpose and trying to discover what those are. I feel like one of the callings that God had put on my life, as I stated in the very beginning, was sharing my testimony and sharing what I have discovered about why I'm on test for all of these years and I'm still praying for guidance for the things that I feel like he has called me to do because I feel inadequate. I don't feel like I'm qualified to sit here and to even begin to speak about these things because I'm like, look at me. And then I think about it and I'm like, look at all the other prophets. You had a murderer. You had a tax collector. You had thieves. He used Paul who used to be Saul. And he was um, persecuting all these Christians. And he was like going around seeking them to kill them. And God used Paul. The Lord can use anything. He can use me. I may be just a wife. I may be just a mother. I may be just a stay-at-home mom. But with Christ? I am so much more. We're all qualified through Christ. We are not held by our own strength. And that is the beauty of it all. We are made whole through Christ. And I obviously, I still have a lot to learn. And I'm going to be transparent about it. I don't know everything. I, I don't know everything. If I knew everything, why would I need God? That is my testimony. And as I'm rounding this thing out, I just want to say, if you related with any part of my testimony, or if you... Feel like you would like to share yours in the comments down below please do and if you're watching this and you start feeling like you have questions about it and you start to feel the knocking maybe you're sitting there and you you're dripping sweat maybe you're shaking maybe you feel like you're gonna vomit you're gonna faint maybe you feel like your lungs are about to explode jesus is calling jesus is knocking and let him in it's okay. Open the door. Let him in. Answer. You don't have to hide anything. You can open the door and not worry about if it's a mess. He expects it to be a mess. That was his purpose. That's why he died. Because he knew humans are sinful. It was proven time after time after time after time after time with the Israelites especially. Which was God's chosen people. They still weren't perfect. But it's okay. God doesn't expect you to be perfect, but you are perfect through Him. It's like the old hymn, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You don't have to go try to hide or rush to clean anything up before you answer the door. You just have to give Him permission to do it. You might be sitting there wondering or saying to yourself, yeah, okay, I will. I'll do it. You might be asking though, how in the world can you do that how do you even achieve the salvation and y'all let me tell you it's literally easy to obtain the salvation because the hard part was already done jesus already died he already bled he was already pierced and he rose from the dead god rose him from the dead to show that death has no claim on you through jesus there's an acronym that we're gonna do it's a b c d a you gotta ask b 
I believe you sent your son, your only son, to die on the cross for my sins. Confess. I am not perfect. The blood of Jesus is the only way that I can be washed clean and saved. And I believe that he did. He did it. And now I'm asking for it. And finally, D done. Alright, yeah, so that is all that I have. That is my tip. I hope this I hope this helps.